it is kind of nice to have a competitor and a friend uh, and someone I admire and respect uh, make it easier for me to do business with you. Um, I don't share those views. I'm going to talk about two things today. Number one, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see in the venture markets overall. I'm going to try to get through a lot of slides really quickly to spend more time talking about venture. I want to cover some things that I think most everybody knows that are kind of obvious, try to put them in the context to lead into the rest of the conversation. In 2013 to 2015, we saw a massive explosion and irrational behavior. You can see at the top, valuations up 3x. Median valuations went up 3x in three years, and capital invested went up 2x. In this period of time, and I'll make these slides available if you don't, because I'm going kind of fast. Uh, in this time period, we ushered in the era of what's now known as a unicorn. We all know that. But what a lot of people don't know in this room, I presume you all do, is high prices often came with structure. And the famous VC saying was, you name the price, I'll name the terms. And really what this meant was, sorry to pause, but this thing is pausing me. Price is not always price, is not always price. And so when you're getting multiple liquidation preferences, when you're investing in a 20 or $50 billion valuation, but you have IPO protection, uh, price isn't price isn't price. And that's something that I think we need to be aware of. Uh, number two thing that I think most of you know is that many of us, myself included, predicted winter was coming. Uh, in fact, winter did come. The problem is global warming. And global warming meant that winter was pretty mild. So median valuations did come down. Funding, the time to get a company funded did elongate maybe by three, four, five months in companies raising more capital. But I want to talk about why I think global climate change, global warming, uh, metaphorically, impacted our markets and, and why winter wasn't longer. Number one was the influx of foreign capital. So if you look at anything from the SoftBank and uh, Saudi Arabia $100 billion tech fund, if you look at the declining oil prices and the fact that Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and across the Arabian Peninsula, more dollars wanting to be put into the global tech sector and also wanting to be put into the US uh, tech sector. One of the slides I don't have is if you look at the low interest rate environment and more people wanting to pile dollars into US uh, tech investing as a source of returns. If you look at Tomasek in Singapore, they've announced they're actually going to set up a U.S. venture capital fund. If you look at Alibaba, uh, just as a metaphor for all of China, writing an $800 million uh, check into Magic Leap. Overall, there's a lot more ch uh, foreign money, Chinese money, Singapore, uh, the Middle East coming into the United States. Number two is the rise of the corporate VC. Uh, this is from CB Insights. If you look in the last four years, the number of corporates that have set up venture capital arms has more than doubled. And of course, there's been some usual suspects from Intel, Google, Qualcomm, Salesforce, people who have been doing this prolifically for some time. But there's really some surprising new entrants from four, uh, sorry, GM writing a $500 million check, BMW setting up more than a $500 million venture fund. Industries that are being disrupted are putting large amount of capital because it's now well and truly on the strategic agenda. And that is having an impact on our industry. The third reason is M&A. M&A has picked up. The more M&A that happens, the more liquidity that happens, the more dollars that go into funding innovation. I've just listed a few. Again, I will make this available. Uh, but if you look at the billions of dollars that have come in acquisitions in the last few years from fairly traditional companies, uh, I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing more dollars put to work. And of course, all eyes are on Snapchat. It's expected to IPO uh, in March. I don't know if that date has changed, but that's the last I had heard. Um, and will that usher in a new era of the IPO? Most of the exits over the last few years have been M&A. Will it usher an era of the new IPO? 
Um, so all of these get people increasingly bullish on the sector. But the venture capital industry ourselves have gone out and raised mega funds. So there were $11 billion plus funds raised in the last year. And they have significant amounts of dry powder. They've all brought in new partners. All those new partners are not on boards and they're deal junkies. That's just how that works. Uh, the white bar is contributions that LPs make to venture capitalists. So that's the dollars they write into the funds. It's not the commitments that they make to a fund. They might commit a $50 million check to a fund, but then every year they get capital calls. And if you look at the capital calls versus the distributions or the dollars they're getting back every year, they're now getting a lot of dollars back and more dollars than they're writing. And what you end up with when you're getting more dollars back as an LP is writing more dollars and it increases their allocation even to the asset class. So VCs are uh, becoming junkies and there's more of us and more funds and there's more dollars going into funds. The trend of venture capital overall is going up. So this is my summary slide. Increase in foreign capital, increase in corporate investors, increase in LP distributions, newer VC funds, bigger VC funds. A point I didn't talk about is repatriation of capital. Uh, you probably have read that they're trying to relax the laws that allow Apple uh, and the big corporations, Google and everybody else that are holding foreign reserves to repatriate, repatriate it without uh, paying tax. If that happens, you will likely see a lot more dollars still going to venture, going to M&A, going to hiring, going to R&D. So that should have a positive impact on us. And the likely continued robust M&A markets and IPO markets, nobody expects any of that to end. Therefore, my prognosis for 2017 and 2018 for venture is very strong. Now you would expect me to say it because I'm a VC. Um, but I tend not to be shy about calling the negatives. This is actually what I view happening with one exception. Uh, perhaps his name is Donald Trump, but the real exception is uh, just a black swan event that no one can predict. And uh, if you didn't read the black swan, you should, Nassim Taleb, but just saying markets don't tend to change linearly. They tend to change with some dramatic unanticipated event like September 11th. And obviously, I can't forecast that. But in leaving aside a black swan, I think the next two years are going to be very good to us. Um, I also promised I would talk about corporate investors, the devil. Um, but what I thought I would do is talk about what I would do if I were a corporate VC. And maybe these are my lessons learned. I had a softer view than Fred, but when I first got into venture capital and started a blog, I have a blog, it's called Both Sides of the Table, if uh, any of you are interested in following it. Um, I wrote strategic money is an oxymoron. Strategic money is an oxymoron because as a startup founder, I found it anything but strategic. I had two very large German investors. They were, I, I was based in London. They were German industrial companies. And I thought, I'm going to take this money and suddenly they're going to roll me out everywhere. Well, guess what? They didn't roll me out everywhere. They weren't willing to get involved in the political battles inside their organizations. Most people thought I was a dot-com douche. And on top of that, when I wanted to cut uh, R&D budget a little bit to increase sales budget a little bit, when I wanted to acquire a company in the US and try to go global, they were fighting against me every step of the way for reasons I had unforeseen because they didn't actually care about my revenue growth. They didn't actually care about US expansion. They didn't care about me raising more capital. What they wanted was us to ship more product for their projects based in Germany. And this is when I started to realize there's a tension that can exist. It doesn't always exist, but that can exist between corporate interests and my own interests, and it made it difficult to raise capital, and it made it difficult to exit the company. So I actually live this as a CEO. So given all that, what would I do? Number one is I think be clear on why you're doing this. As a company, are you doing this for financial returns? Are you doing this to augment your own R&D? Are you doing this for business development? 
advantages. But I think as a corporate, it doesn't make sense to just set up a fund. It's let's understand this. Now, sometimes I think it happens just for career reasons. It's you have someone smart and ambitious inside a company that has lots of opportunities and could leave the company and go do something meaningful who says, why don't we set up a VC arm and then I could stay. And they attract four or five people and they build something around them and investing is certainly cool and sexy and fun. Um, and so it happens. And I think that's the wrong way <laughs> to go about venture capital. I, I actually do see that happening. Um, if it were me and I were setting up a fund, for, you know, I've had this conversation with many corporates, is I think the access to R&D that came out in the interview with Fred is real. If you have teams of people working at the forefront of what's going on in industry, whether it's working or failing, you will get a lot more institutional awareness of what's actually happening. Being in the room versus reading the press makes a huge difference. And if the goal is simply to learn and then figure out how to transfer that back into the organization, that would be worth doing, in my opinion. If it's for pure financial reason, I understand it a lot less. I know that's how many people set up their corporate arms, but it doesn't seem to me that a, an objective of a corporation ought to be, let's just go make a bunch of investments and make a bunch of money. But when I asked this room why you were doing this, it seems people were pretty split, like kind of half-half between augmenting, augmenting uh, R&D to financial returns as the primary motivator, with some people saying business development. So I understand that not everybody sees it this way. I kind of three, see three successful models. Uh, on the left-hand side is Google Ventures. For all intents and purposes, I can see uh, for a long period of time, they do seem to be doing it just financially. They have access, they have capital, they have ambitious people, and therefore they seem to be making a lot of investments, and they seem to be a good investor. I don't have anything negative to say. Uh, in the middle bucket is some people I think are really doing it for platform participation. So if I look at Amazon setting up the uh, Amazon Echo Fund, you know, if you're gonna go plant the seed and give $2 million to a bunch of startups or a million dollars a piece and give them both capital encouragement and access to put more R&D budgets into your platform, I think that's a pretty reasonable strategy. I know uh, at Salesforce we were very successful and Salesforce has been uh, after I left, very successful with that as a strategy. I know Airbnb and Slack uh, have started to do this. I think I saw Dave McClure somewhere back there uh, had encouraged Twilio to do this back in the day. I think it is a clever strategy. If you employ that strategy, I recommend writing checks but not making it a requirement. Win through positive, win through light, not heat. Don't make it an absolute requirement. If you make it a requirement that they must build specific stuff for you, you will end up with selection bias. You'll end up with selection bias because the best and brightest won't take your money. Like Fred said, they, they really won't. If, if it's like, here's a couple million dollars as part of a round with some people we trust and respect in the industry, we'd love to throw some resources at helping you be successful, build on our platform, but of course it's not a requirement, take our money will be significantly more successful, in my opinion, than trying to make it a requirement. And the final bucket, Intel, Comcast, at least in my conversations, I can't speak for these organizations, they seem to be interested in uh, being at the forefront of innovation and making investments so that the company stays at the forefront of innovation. And there's plenty of companies that do all of those. Um, understand the VC bias. I'm glad the Fred Wilson quote came out there because that's the way most VCs think. It doesn't make them right. Probably there's some directional correctness to what they say, but the better you understand the bias, the better you can play. The better you understand the people sitting at the poker table with you, the better player you're gonna be. Make sure to play offense. If you wait for the phone calls to come in and are reactive and say, oh, my favorite VC just called me, whenever I get that, my first thought is, why am I so lucky to get this call? Even when Fred calls me, I think that. I'm like, well, I don't know. You didn't send me Twitter, so. Um, I play offense. 
it's how I do my job, it's how I encourage you to do your job. Offense to me is saying, the smartest guy in the industry, if you wanna know in my opinion, is a guy named Lyndall Ekman, who now works for Foundry Group, and he puts out dollars into VC funds as an LP, and then he'll call me and he say, Mark, I wanna do a portfolio review. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I wanna go line by line in all your portfolio and just get your view on what's working. Then he goes through, you know, 35, 50 companies, <coughs> And they're like, okay, can you introduce us to those two? I don't know if we're a good fit, but we want to go meet them. That's offense. He's not waiting for my call. He knows my call comes with some degree of selection bias, some degree of marketing. The more you play offense, I think, the better you'll do. Develop a VC feeder network. Understand which VCs are actually pro-working with people like you. And by developing that network, you will see better deal flow. I do the same thing in my job again. I work with seed funds, I work with angels. I try to identify people that I think know something that I don't know or have access that I don't have. And that I think when they call me or when I call them, we have a unique relationship relative to everybody else. Otherwise, they're just marketing to me and marketing's okay, but I want something unique. And I think you can develop that. Now, I've had a very good history investing with corporate investors, uh, you know, Time Warner, I've invested with Comcast, I've invested with WPP, um, Verizon, you know, I've had nothing but good experiences if I choose the people and the organization and the incentives and the motives and try to avoid the, the warning signs. Decide whether you want to follow or lead. In general, in my opinion, and that doesn't make it right, I think corporate should follow rather than lead. Because if you follow, and follow simply meaning I'm gonna find VCs that I tr like, trust, and respect, whether it's Greylock, Excel, Benchmark, Sequoia, Andreessen, Upfront Ventures, whoever, uh, and you develop good relationships, if they're writing a $15 million check and you're gonna write five million, if you're not driving just for financial returns and you have other motives, you will get into better deals that way. And if your goal is R&D or access, that's a better way to get access than to be a lead and own a bigger percentage and try to drive financial returns in the second or third tier of companies. So it really goes back to what are your objectives. It seems in this room, 40% uh, regularly lead, so I know that I, uh, I have some work to do to persuade you, uh, but a lot of people are okay to follow, and I think that's probably good. Staff the appropriate corporate epoxy. There's many corporate funds who say, we're such and such big corporate. We do 25 billion a year in sales, and you're gonna get all these benefits. Uh, but they don't have the team to go deliver the organization. And this is what I lived as an entrepreneur, is promises unfulfilled. And what I actually found is when I went to the business units, they wanted to do anything but what their corporate investor told them to do. So I actually had a harder time getting the BUs actually to work with me because they were deeply skeptical and cynical. They weren't motivated financially. And they knew that these guys back at the corporate were probably making tons of money off me. Uh, so I actually found it harder. To the extent you can deliver the organization, not completely, but deliver it in some way, shape, or form, that reputation will get into market and you will win more deals. Make sure you have executive support. In order to get that corporate epoxy working, you need all the way up, I think, to CEO. I did a very large deal with a very big media company in Los Angeles in the last couple of years. And I watched these really big, powerful business units that had billions of sales and had no interest in our tiny little startup succeeding, stomp all over it and not allow it to grow and succeed. It can only come if top level people are gonna step in. Get rid of the corporate bullshit. Rofers and side-by-side -side commercial agreements and all the things that you're gonna try to force us to take. Earn the right earn the right to get better commercial agreements because you're a good actor. The reason I say that is not just because I hate all this corporate bullshit, but because you will end up with selection bias. If Fred Wilson knows that you're just a side-by-side -side venture investor not asking for anything special, who works your ass off to deliver an organization, he will feel better about letting you into deals. If you have these terms in there and you get in, ask yourself if you really want to be in that deal. Number nine, if possible, create some 
incentives that are similar to VC incentives. The reason I like this idea is then when I'm sitting across the table from the person, I know that they have the same objective in having this startup be massively successful because they'll make money, the same incentives as I have. Um, I think I just have two slides if it'll... Okay, so almost 60% of the room uh, who were polled who are corporate venture investors have either venture-like uh, uh, incentives, that's 20%, or some hybrid, 57%. I think that's good. I think that's healthy. Uh, and this is the final thing is, as a corporate, don't forget that you really ought to lean on the scale, like put your thumb on it. And what I mean is, this is why I don't believe you should be pure financial investors. If you invest in a company, it ought to be because you know that you can actually use your organization to help that asset be more successful than it otherwise would be. Then you deliver the benefit to the startup and you get good trust and uh, more people wanting to work with you. But if you put your thumb on the scale and actually help them succeed, then that company ought to be relatively more successful than its peer group of competitors that don't have the corporate benefits that you can deliver. So I don't know why a company with billions of dollars in sales and billions of dollars in assets and capital that wants to invest in venture wouldn't want those companies to have an unfair advantage. So for me, I would say lean on the scale. So I hope those 10 insights at least give you some perspective on how a very pro corporate VC think, uh, sorry, uh, VC thinks about the corporate market. Uh, and if you're feeling like other VCs feel like you're the devil, just give me a call. Thank you.